honest and respectful conversation. I hope I haven't filibustered you all into uh, some nolence at this point. Let's see how many good and hearty souls we still have who want to testify. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to come to line up. Don't rush the mic. Don't slowly, graciously, respectfully. We're going to ask you to come up. Some of you will line up on this side. Some of you will line up on that side. We've got two microphones up front. We're going to ask Mr. Hartnett to surrender that chair for the front. And we'll ask Arwen if you'll move another chair over there so Mr. Hartnett can sit down again. Come take a seat. We're going to try and ask you to limit yourself to just a couple of minutes. If I could ask staff to move the sign in the easel, I think that'll make it a little easier for folks to get here. And folks, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. First thing is I'd like to ask the room to come to order. The good news is we have great acoustics. The bad news is it means we can hear even the slightest whisper in the back. So we're going to ask everybody to be very quiet, respectful to the witnesses. And then I'm going to ask the witnesses to limit themselves to just a couple of minutes. And uh, some of you who've been here before know that I like to say, if you have a topic sentence, if you remember that concept from high school English, start with your topic sentence. What is the one thing you want to make sure that the authority, members of the Senate, the LAO, the Department of Finance, what's that one thing you want us to make sure we remember as we go about making our decision and moving forward? Sir, welcome. My name's Carl Freiberg. I live in Berkeley, California. Uh, actually, I had a prepared presentation uh, more aimed at public safety as I spoke at the hearing, but I really want to address what you've been bringing up all day today, Chairman Smithing, and also Senator Lowenthal. And it involves more of a soft answer to your hard questions. I'm a forest economist by training. I know what hard answers are. I'm, I don't have the hard answers that you're looking for. But I want to look at, let's take this building, for example, that we're sitting in right now that you alluded to. It was uh, originally an idea brought forth, I believe, in 1850. It wasn't until 1869 19 years till this building was actually completed. It, it was a long process, and do you know the construction actually stopped several times because they did not have funds for it. And, but then it, the funds came, and then it went up some more, and construction stopped again. And now we are here a couple hundred years later to enjoy the benefits of this historic room. And I'm very thankful for that. A couple weeks ago on uh, NOVA, you might have uh, seen the program about the Grand Coulee Dam, another big project. At the time, you know, people said it was impossible to do. It couldn't be done. Same thing with Hoover Dam. And now we're asking some of these real questions. I mean, you, you, you have to handle the financing, but you also have to sometimes take a risk. It's almost like uh, in my younger days, I said I was a forest economist. I was also a firefighter, smoke jumper. You know, you just jump out of the plane, and that's it. And, and uh, come June... <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes I was. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, this is my first time up here, and that's why I'm even shaking here. <laughs> but uh, come June, uh, everyone on this committee is going to be faced with a very hard question, and it's going to be a fish or cut bait type thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next witness, please. Uh, Rich Tolmack, uh, California Rail Foundation. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and members. Um, I, my topic sentence is um, looking for money in all the wrong places. And my belief is that the authority has uh, gone about this uh, funding in an upside-down and backwards way. And what they do need to do 
um, is to step back, think more carefully about what north-south travel and traffic consists of in California and stop trying to gold plate the Central Valley and not do anything for the Bakersfield to Santa Clarita Gap, which is, is frankly only 80 miles and frankly has both auto and truck traffic, which is substantial and sufficient to justify a new rail line there. Um, by gold plating 220 mile an hour service between Bakersfield and Merced being the first segment, uh, it's much more expensive than filling that 80 mile gap. And that 80 mile gap has not only um, the passenger traffic, but also the significant traffic to the ports and other possible use of nighttime uses of the facility. And I feel very strongly that both uh, the BNSF Railway and the shippers uh, have a great interest in having multimodal improvements, uh, not just passenger improvements. And that's actually how you can identify something that will produce the um, the, the greenhouse gas uh, benefits that everybody is after. What we're doing now instead is debating a crazy route in the Central Valley and little bits of money on the two ends and actually not finishing the network. Thank you very much. Next witness. I'm Kathy Hamilton with Community Coalition on High Speed Rail. Um, I just wanted to, um, to ask that the, um, that the committee seriously look at what the experts are asking. Multiple experts, as Senator, you've brought up many times, have brought up the ridership issue. That's been discussed a lot today. Ridership looked at by an internal peer review group with two out of five of the experts uh, that have previously looked at the plan in 2006 and one chairman who actually uh, received monies from Cambridge Systematics in previous consulting um, gigs does not equal an objective look. We have an awful lot writing on this. What we have writing on this is cap and trade. What we have writing on this is profitability. We need that ridership is everything and the peer review group in their March 21st letter stated that they wanted the uh, High Speed Rail Authority to hire UC Berkeley ITS to publicly air those numbers. That has not been done to date and that needs to be done. And the last thing I just wanted to say was um, uh, that um, Senator, you in the blended system uh, suggested three parts of a plan and I'm not going to go into them. But the third one, the most important one that has not been addressed is the reduction in scope for the EIR. That has not been done and you said it was a non-starter to you unless at least three of these tenants were, um, were followed. And it was just a starting plan. It wasn't the plan. It was a way to start. But that has not been addressed and that will have the, um, the 50 miles of the peninsula with a sword over their head with an EIR that's done that way. So I Thank appreciate it. Comments. Next witness. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ryan Heller and I represent I Will Ride, a group of students from California colleges and universities who believe that high-speed rail is crucial for our future. Um, I respectfully ask this committee to support the high-speed rail authority's new business plan. Um, our student-organized, student-run, student-inspired effort began at UC Merced last year uh, because we believe that this project is right for California and right for our generation. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, we're ready to build it, we're ready to pay for it, and we're ready to ride it. I founded I Will Ride because I believe that the United States can have what many other countries already do, <clears throat> excuse me, which is 21st century world-class transportation. I also believe that there is no better place to start than here in California and specifically in the Central Valley. The High Speed Rail Authority has worked to make this project a reality, listening to concerns and updating the previous plan to address the many months of public comment, legislative hearings, LAO and peer review. The result is a leaner, smarter, and better plan. 
Construction of the high-speed rail system will provide job opportunities for those who need them and revitalize our economy, allowing students like myself, who graduate from universities in the Central Valley, to find good-paying jobs and make a home there. High-speed rail is a green alternative to our current modes of transportation and will help clean our air. It will also be more cost-effective than building the new roads and airports that are required to meet our future population needs. For these reasons, I respectfully urge the committee to support the new business plan and allocate funding to begin construction as soon as possible. Thank you. And I also Thank have copies of my statement for the record. Thank you. One moment, please. <laughs> Next witness. Welcome. Yes, cost and trust. My name is Ron Hoggard, a retired city manager, nine and a half years in uh, Corcoran, California. Um, I spent a, a lot of my time working on uh, bringing business to the Central Valley and to Kings County. Tomato processing plant, call centers, powder tomato plant internationally, recognized uh, cheese and whey plants with exports overseas. They all had one thing in common. They all had the money to fund their projects. Uh, when in government, people would always say, you need to run it like a business. 33 billion, 40 billion, 98 billion, 117 billion, 68.4 billion, whatever the number is, and it will change, we don't have the money. Our government is already in the hole billions of dollars. We in California need to stop and sign up for a 12-step program on spending. Please don't violate the provisions of 1A. We are in a low trust situation. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Elizabeth Alexis from CARD. Um, what I want to say is that the main issue that we're having is that even though the facts have changed dramatically since this project was originally proposed, the cost has gone from you know, 30 billion to 70, 80, whatever the number is. Um, we now are looking at a blended system on the peninsula because it's clear that a, a dedicated system is not going to be acceptable. These have real world consequences. I mean, you have a handout here and despite the authority's assertion that it would go in two hours and 40 minutes will be a typical time for, um, from LA to San Francisco. With the blended system, it is going to caught, you know, the fastest train is going to be at three hours. This is from the engineer's report in the business plan and most of the trains will take three and a half hours. And in the normal world, when something like that happens, you would go to another part of the system and you would make a change to compensate. Because if you're locking yourself into something where most of the trains are going to be three and a half hours forever, and you're being asked to spend $70 billion in that system, you have to really think twice about whether that's a good investment for the people of California. I would like to, to reference one other project that just, it just reminds me of this one, and I would say that's the the Bay Bridge and, and the recent renovation. And that was a project that was originally proposed to be quite affordable and, and it was sold as having this very cool design feature and you could have it for only, I think, I don't know, two billion or whatever it was. And in that particular case, there was a, de there was a brand new source of funds, which was a very exciting source, I think, in the Bay Area, which were the Bay Area tolls, or the bridge tolls. This would be great. You could solve all your problems. You know what's happened? Even when it became clear that this bridge would cost a very different, different number, a very different number, you didn't change the design, and 98% or some large percentage of all those bay tolls that could have gone towards all sorts of things in the Bay Area have been sucked into that project. And, and this just seems, you, you know, even if it seems unlikely that you would have access to cap and trade, but even if you did, the question is, would you want to? Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jolene Jamison. I happen to be the vice mayor for the city of Hanford. You know, I, I've listened <clears throat> the better part of the day, and I've, I've kind of gone back and forth, but as an elected official, first and foremost, I, I found the first question I was asked, why did I run? And I said, well, you know, that's real easy. I'm a nana. I have a grandson that's three years old, or soon to be. And I listen to a lot of these young people, and there are tomorrow, and he is definitely my tomorrow. We have a spending addiction that says, 
If it's fast, it's smooth, it's sexy, we want it. But the reality is we have to make decisions inherently to what that future is going to be. Now, my children are 25 through 30. They are what we will be tomorrow. Someday they're going to be what we are now. But my grandson is going to inherit some either very good lessons in life. He's going to learn how to money manage his life responsibly. And if we don't set an example by spending within our means reasonably, respectfully, then we won't do anything good, whether it's on a local level, <clears throat> a state level, or a federal level. We're, we're going to have to look at ourselves and respect ourselves. We're going to have to trust that our decisions are setting great examples for our young people. Because I have those young people in my life. And they love the technology. They, they love fast. And they would like to get somewhere fast. They can on a plane, I tell them. Okay. And if, if my grandson wants to do something really fast, like ride a train at 3, trust me, 55 is fast. But the debt ratio, that will live long after. Can we put it back on the, on the planning and do it more responsible at a time when it's economically driven? Thank you, Madam Vice Thank Mayor. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next witness, just a little prompt. When I go like this, that doesn't mean wahoo. That means please wrap it up, okay? <laughs> I will. Uh, there you go. <laughs> next witness. Thank you. I will uh, be brief. My name is Michael Quigley. I'm here on behalf of the California Alliance for Jobs. We represent 2,500 union construction contractors and over 80,000 union construction workers across northern and central California. Currently, our industry is facing a level of unemployment over two and a half times the state average. We have uh, <clears throat> been suffering through this economic downturn much harder than the rest of the state. Construction is the leading indicator of economic activity, and by constructing high-speed rail, we can see that uh, we will have a, a catalyst that can bring back our economy. Um, and finally, I believe that the new business plan has uh, a lot of important changes that are reflected from the concerns brought forth by members of the public and also even members of this committee. And I think that uh, that's an important step in the right direction, and it shows the authority is responsive and is willing to provide a very quality product that will be of value to the taxpayers, both uh, economically in the near term and provide a very important transportation option for our future growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Good evening. Uh, Doug Verbone, representing Kings County Board of Supervisors, and I want to thank you all for letting us uh, come here and give you our uh, ideas and uh, problems we may have with high-speed rail. Uh, I know it takes a lot, and I respect what all you did today. And I had a prepared statement here I wanted to read, but Senator, Senator Lowenthal answered all those questions or presented all those questions to high-speed rail, and I, I, I respect that. Uh, basically, what I'm going to talk about is the last two years with High Speed Rail in Kings County, we've had a lack of coordination. We've asked the uh, High Speed Rail Authority to work with us over the past year, and uh, they've refused to do so. It's come about the last month that uh, since uh, Dan Richard has showed up that he has met with us one time and apologized. We have not had any of our questions answered or dealt with in the past 12 months. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to be a representative of the community when you can't even have anybody listen to you. And we protect the people of Kings County, and we want our concerns answered by the High Speed Rail Authority. And before we move forward and before they get any more funds, we, they need to answer all 61 of our questions, and I'll submit those when I get, get back to you guys. These are concerns of people that work every single day in Kings County. And we talk about job killers, lack of jobs. It's $100 million annually out of our pocket in Kings County that this rail will do will dis disrupt, and that has not been answered yet, and we need to address those issues before we can move forward, and I respect all the questions you guys gave today, and, I, and it gives me faith in the system to see you guys up here today and doing what you did. Thank you, and are you on the Board of Supervisors? Yes, sir? All right, well then let me call you Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor, uh, the reason I 
walk through the 15 or 20 issues that I raised earlier is because I wanted to lay out some of the areas where I think we have questions that remain for the high-speed rail authority. And what I'm hoping we're going to do through this hearing and through others, and Senator Solnay may choose to do some in, under the auspices of the Transportation Committee as an informational hearing. Senator uh, Lowenthal may choose to do hearings under the auspices of the uh, Select Committee that he chairs. Uh, but how, whatever the venue is, I want us to lay out these questions over the course of the next few weeks, the next couple of months, and then give the High-Speed Rail Authority the time necessary to come back with good answers. And I want to create a process here that ensures that we give them the questions we have and we tell them that before we vote we expect to have good answers to those questions and your questions can be included in that process. Now, in fairness to all parties, um, there are some, to the firefighters earlier comment, at some point you make a decision, am I going to jump or not? without having all the answers to what you're going to find when you land on the ground. Some of these questions have levels of detail that will only be answered later. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's important for the authority to reestablish some level of trust with communities like yours and candidly with communities like mine. Uh, because uh, right now I don't think trust us is a very persuasive line for the authority to take given the history that you've had and other folks around the state have had. So my plan, my goal, my hope and expectation is we will lay out a series of questions. I think we've raised some of those today. We'll keep doing that in the weeks and months ahead. And then at some point we'll say, what are the good answers to all those questions before we're asked to cast that final decision? Now one other piece. Um, to the extent that there isn't trust on all of these issues, one of the areas that we're going to be looking at is can we attach various conditions of approval to the, to the allocation of funds if and when an allocation of funds is made, whether that's through something we call a trailer bill, whether it's through budget bill language, whatever the device is that we use here, I think people are going to want some assurances that commitments that are made are kept if funding is going to flow to the authority. And that will take time to negotiate and we'll try and make that as open and public a process as we can so that people see it. Just a word to Mr. Richard on this point and to his colleagues on the High Speed Rail Authority. The previous administration, want to underscore that, the previous administration and the previous executive made commitments about the conditions of approval for the budget those conditions were not then honored in spite of the fact that they were made to me as the chair of the budget subcommittee personally and they were made to the committee in full in an open public hearing. Moreover, the previous administration, the prior governor, took out his pen and blue penciled or vetoed conditions that were attached to the funding. Now we were subsequently informed by the legislative council that that was unlawful. We were also told by the legislative council that there wasn't a heck of a lot we could do about it after those conditions had been deleted. But essentially we were told, no, you can't have that one both ways. If you're going to take the money, then you've got to take the conditions it comes with. I'm going to be looking to the authority and to the administration, if we get to that point in the process, to provide assurances in an open and public way that that's not going to happen to us again. I want to be very clear. Didn't happen with this administration, didn't happen with the leadership of the current board, but you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We're very much in that place. So thank you for your comments, Supervisor. I know you have had a long day, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. And, you know, we at Keene County oppose high free rail because of the conditions were put in front of us with the lack of answering our questions. And, you know, being a, a born and raised here in California, the fifth generation, California is a leader of the free world. And if we are going to build a high rail, we need to do it by example and lead by example. And I think we started off on the wrong foot. Maybe time to stop it, regroup, and start over again. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Dunn here for the California Association for High Speed Trains, and I'd just like to thank for the, the chair for the opportunity to be here and for the hearing that you're providing for all the interested parties to come and comment upon the new business plan. I'd like to thank the authority for that new plan. I think it's the right direction. Uh, I know we have a long road to hoe, 
we've got tough decisions to be made, but we do that routinely here in California, and I agree with the supervisor. California should be leading this project. The four, four of the most densely populated population areas in, this, in our nation are here in the state, uh, and, and we're going to have population growth in the Central Valley that's in millions over the next 20 years. We need to have a high-speed rail. We can do it. We do tough things every day here, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and your committee to make sure that we get it done right, because it is important that we address the concerns of the, of the citizens that are going to be affected by this track and, and get it done correctly. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Next witness. Uh, good, good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Richard Valley. I represent District 2 at the Kings County Board of Supervisors, and I believe that there are enough uh, members from our community here today that our topic sentence will ring true uh, by the end of the evening. Uh, Senators, you understand how long the discussions have been held on high-speed rail. You've had those discussions here in these chambers. You outlined them, Mr. Chair, perfectly over the years. Well, it took until Tuesday, April 3rd of this month for the high-speed rail to authority to finally come to Kings County and begin to listen to our issues and our concerns, not only of the Kings County Board of Supervisors, but more importantly, the taxpayers there. That's not acceptable. The city of Corcoran is currently looking at three proposed alignments that already have the ability to just destroy our downtown and our community as of the vote uh, that the High Speed Rail Authority took last Thursday in San Francisco. We're now one step closer to the reality of losing our Amtrak station in Corcoran. And that would also mean the loss of Amtrak service in Hanford, as you heard. Ms. Uh, Chairman Richard mistakenly pointed out that the only people that would be affected by the loss of an Amtrak station in the city of Corcoran is the inmates, and that's not true. Real people are going to be affected. Real taxpayers are going to be affected. I'm here to represent to you today, um, Senators, that Kings County, we are in the fight of our lives to save our churches, our farms, our homes, and our dairies. Mr. Uh, Chairman Richard today, he represented the fact how vital it is to quickly run through our community to uh, snatch up a right away. He, he, he felt bad for two buildings. He, he he, he felt bad that he was in Bakersfield and looked up and saw two new buildings that, are, that were erected along an alignment that he had his eyes on for through the city of Bakersfield. It's not about those two new buildings. It's about the farms and the dairies that have been passed on generation to generation there in Kings County. Super Mr. Chair, this, I'll, I'll close. This aggressive attitude that I witnessed today uh, uh, by Chairman Richard is not the attitude that was presented in Kings County on April 3rd. He apologized profusely for our community being ignored, so I'm surprised at the, uh, how quickly he dismissed uh, uh, our concerns in Kings County before you today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Let's go here, 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 and then to the empty chair, which will soon be filled. Welcome, sir. Here. Right there. Yes, good, good evening, sir. My name is Ross Browning. I'm a Kings County resident. If I have to sum it up with a summary statement, I say let's go back to basics, and basics is Prop 1A. The citizens of this state made a contract with the government and legislature of this state that we want a high-speed rail, and for that we are willing to spend $10 million dollars. It has to provide this, the following items. It must go from Los Angeles to San Francisco in two hours and 40 minutes. No more. You can always go less if you want. It doesn't say every other train. It says trains. Every train must do that. Uh, I, I don't see how they're ever going to meet that. In fact, I heard today that um, the, uh, the engineers said that, they, that uh, they, they told Chairman Richards that the train could be built according to Prop 1A. I'm going to tell them it can't be built according to Prop 1A. You just can't get things out of your way and make it down to L.A. in that amount of time. Funding must be in place and identified before anything takes place. We've heard today that they have no idea where the funding is coming from. We have no idea if there is funding. We're talking about a cap-and-trade situation that we could talk about forever. <laughs> Show me in 1A where that's, that's part of the language. You know, I, we could be talking 10 years from now, we still won't know what cap and trade can or will or won't do or whatever. So I just when 
when things get to the point where you just get lost in the details and you're, you forget that you came into the swamp to drain the swamp, and you're looking at that alligator, just, just go back to Prop 1A and say it either is or it ain't. That's what the people voted for, and that's what I'll give them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next witness. I, okay. Uh, we think the proposed project is the wrong plan in the wrong place. I'd say welcome, but I haven't had you introduce yourself to uh, us yet. You asked for the topic sentence first. Oh, all right. I stand, <laughs> I stand, I stand corrected and, and humbled, so go right ahead. Sir. I'm David Schoenburn, president of TransDef. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking exactly the right questions and for your exceedingly measured conclu concluding comments. I'm here to say that the business plan is not a business plan. First, there's no business. Second, there's no plan. There's no money to do anything other than this proposed track in the Central Valley. As you discerned, there's nothing else in the business plan that is real and funded. What it is is a sales job to induce you to release bond funds to match ARA funds, I'm glad to see that you're a tough customer. We think the authority got distracted by the availability of ARA funding and totally lost sight of the realities of building a statewide system. In particular, the availability of public funds has allowed them to avoid having to attract private sector partners. We believe that had ARA funds not come along, the authority would not be before you seeking funds for this project. Instead, they would have been forced to find a private sector partner at the project's beginning, not in the middle or the end, which would have resulted in a project in the I-5 corridor at a much lower cost and with no public opposition. Even at this late date, such a project could conceivably still be built with ARA funds if there was some degree of federal flexibility and if the authority turned on a dime and stopped doing what it is currently doing. Environmental review on I-5 could be very quick because the impacts are, are negligible. Additional funds could be used to upgrade the San Joaquin service and connect it via high-speed rail to the Bay Area and to the LA Basin. Using compatible equipment would allow a one-seat ride system-wide. The advantage of such an approach would be the avoidance of massive disruption in the Central Valley cities and farms and a much faster LA to San Francisco trip. We urge the committee to turn down the governor's budget request and create a state, a state structure that will get a public-private partnership going. We are convinced that a political body like the authority is inherently incapable of creating a cost-effective revenue-generating system. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Next witness. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'm John Carlson from Sunnyvale. Um, I'm an engineer that uh, has actually spent a number of years working on the rails, developing a piece of high-speed rail equipment that's, uh, that's one of the leaders in that particular area today. Um, I'm here mostly to voice my support and commitment to rail as a mode of transportation. I believe this is simply the most energy-efficient means of transportation, except, of course, for, uh, for uh, riverboats. Um, yeah, it, it, with, the, uh, with the electrification, we're able to choose a number of different power sources. We've got tremendous flexibility, and at the very least, we extend the tailpipe. We, we get that a, away from, from where we're, we're traveling. Um, I do have a rather large concern, however, re regarding, um, among other things, the text of Proposition 1A. The, the summary text that was on the ballot simply said that this is going to connect the San Francisco metropolitan area with the Los Angeles metropolitan area. However, the actual text with, within the booklet describes that it goes from the Transbay Terminal to LA's Union Station. And I, I'm afraid that just binds our hands very tightly as far as being able to propose different systems, something that would give us good value for our money. For, for example, if we took a, a tangential approach, simply connecting using all existing rail right-of-way from Livermore to Lancaster, we could connect BART to LA Metrolink, Metro Rail, 
at minimal cost. And unfortunately, the language in Proposition 1A doesn't allow for that. That, by the way, would be slightly over a three-hour trip, adds maybe 25 minutes, and, and we could do this incredibly cheaply. So I, I would re respectfully request that we put this back to the voters and ask them to vote for some clarification. Ask, do you want it to go between these stations or between the metropolitan areas? Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next witness. I'm uh, Glenn Parsons and internal rate of return. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members, uh, like Mr. Rossi, I also worked at Bank of America. Uh, as a, I worked as a corporate loan officer making million dollar loans or more 30 years ago and left that for a job in academia, for a career in academia. Looking at the actual business plan that I have in front of me, uh, paraphrasing a little bit in the interest of time, the net project cash flows have been analyzed over the entire analysis period 2013 to 2060 to calculate the projected internal rate of return, IRR. The estimated internal rate of return for the project is 0.78%. It's less than 1%, which is low because capital costs must be paid up front while revenues come in over an extended period into the future. So we can be pretty sure of the expenditures up front, less certain about the uh, revenues in the future. The total project return is insufficient to attract capital to pay for the entire project. While the IRR is low, it does pay back the capital over time. The payback period for the total capital invested is 45 years from the start of construction. It's estimated that the net cash collected will equal the total cash expended in capital by 2057. If government was an investor to, looking to invest in business, this kind of internal rate of return would be thrown out immediately. That's not a very good return. We heard earlier something like 48%. Well, that means there's a huge discount if it ever becomes privatized. We don't ask government to make money off of the police force or the courts or the jails. But when you're spending money that I could freely invest somewhere else, but when invested by the government, I have no choice but to invest it, I ask that you really scrutinize this project, not only the quantity of dollars, but the return. And we have a real measure of the return based on revenue projections if they are accurate. Thank and if anything, they're more. And 20, to finish 2057, uh, uh, Sir John Maynard Keynes, the hero of government spending to stimulate an economy, said in the long run we are dead. By 2057, most of us in this room, or many of us in this room, will probably be dead. <laughs> I hope to be remembered. <laughs> Our next witness. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Jerry Fagudis. I'm with Citizens for California High Speed Rail Accountability. And most of your questions was what is in my statement. I am going to applaud you for asking the right questions. And we trust that you on the board in the Senate will hold their feet to the fire. Make sure this is done right. That's all that we ask. We're not the California citizens against high-speed rail. We're for the accountability. All we ask as taxpayers is that you do the best job you can to spend our money the right way. And I will leave a prepared statement for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next witness, and I believe it's the gentleman in the back. Good evening. My name is David Schweigel. I'm a professional engineer with Californians for High Speed Rail. This is indeed financially and fiscally responsible. The French TGV made a $1.75 billion operating profit in 2010, and based on a thorough review of the Texas Transportation Institute congestion data in the NHTSA safety statistics, had we made the $20 billion investment in 1980, we would be have already reaped $560 billion in congestion relief benefits, plus saving 50,000 lives. And this is indeed the catalyst for the next new real estate boom, revitalizing our city centers. The Central Valley start makes perfect sense. When you look at high-speed rail projects overseas, when you look at the interstate highway system, they all started in the middle. And that gives the bookends 
a vested interest in the success through the completion of the project. This is the bargain of the century. With a single investment, you get renewable energy, clean air, climate change, safety, reliability, 99% on-time performance, mobility, congestion relief, revitalized city centers. You remove 3 million tons of CO2 emissions every year. As a licensed professional engineer responsible for protecting the public health, safety, and welfare, I can tell you with a high degree of confidence, this is indeed the best option for California's future. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next witness. Excuse me, I think. <coughs> nope, you were next. My mom goes first. <laughs> I got to ride home with her. <laughs> I paid for the car. <laughs> yeah, I'm ta and it's her car. <laughs> it's my car. Uh, good he evening. yields his two minutes to you. Oh. Go right <laughs> ahead. Okay, I'm going to mention that. All right. uh, good evening. Uh, the last time we saw, I don't remember you saw, but it was December the 13th. That was my birthday. So I celebrated an unbirthday as my choice to come here. Now what a fun evening I had. But my respect for you grew. That evening, a young man came to the microphone and introduced himself as God. Mm. And you said, well, God, you've got two minutes just like everybody else. <laughs> so I better get with it. Uh, Mr. Richard uh, said to, uh, in the morning meeting that we need to take risks. And we need to move forward. And we don't know if we're going to be successful. There have been successes, and he mentioned a few. So I was going to leave it at that. Well, that God must have been paying attention. He left this piece of paper on a bench. And I was not going to make comment, but this was so good. Once a teacher, always a teacher. Risks and reward. Teach your ch uh, children about risk and return by raffling out a cookie or a pencil. Tell them that if they don't buy a raffle ticket, they can't win. And just because they bought a raffle ticket doesn't guarantee them a reward or a prize. If you use raffle as part of your behavior management plan, just add this explanation as an additional lesson. In life, too, one needs to take a chance or take risks before getting a reward or return. And just because you take risks does not mean that you will get a return or a reward. This principle applies to stocks and bonds and all kinds of investments, and this principle is sadly taught very late in life. And that leads me to something I wrote on December the 13th, and I chose not to make comment. I can't remember which meeting it was now. There's so many. Um, uh, so I passed it up, but I'd like to read it now. It's in regard to a, um, an authority, and it was written by Eleanor Roosevelt, October the 10th, 1943. It's in regards to another authority, the Relocation Authority. And this will which, be your last comment, please. Okay, go, go right real ahead. quick. Here's the essay. Eleanor wrote, to undo a mistake is always harder than not to create one originally, but we seldom have the foresight. And the warnings are there. Thank I you hope very we much. have the foresight. Thank you. Let me go to our next witness. Actually, I think that gentleman was... Let me go to our next witness. <laughs> giving second thoughts to coming between the mother and son, but uh, <laughs> I'll take my chances. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Pedro Modias from the California Public Interest Research Group, CalPERG. Uh, whether we like it or not, more people are going to come to California, and we need to somehow address uh, the transportation infrastructure of the state to meet those needs. Um, and we believe that high-speed rail is the best option that we have uh, for a number of reasons. One of them was actually recently underscored by a report that CalPERG just released about the driving habits of young people. We took a look at the driving habits of 16 to 34 year olds over the time period of 2001 to 2009 and some interesting things came out. One is that it's been, there's been a net decrease of 23% in the vehicle miles traveled by people in that age group over that time period. Over the same time period with the same age group, the number of uh, miles traveled on, on uh, public transportation has increased by 40%. So, while that is not directly the case for high-speed rail, it does make the case that driving is becoming, for whatever reason, less and less of an option for 
the young people of the state, the people who will actually be around when the high-speed rail train is up and running. And so it, for that reason, is quite obviously to us anyway uh, the, the right option for California. And so when the time comes, we would urge uh, you to approve the funding to get this project started. The longer we wait, the more money it's going to end up costing. I do have to point out that four months ago the price tag was $98.5 billion. Four months later the price tag is $68.5 billion. It has been suggested if we wait until the end of the year, it could be free by then. So, uh, you know, you have to be a little careful with these time issues. But, but your point is well taken. Thank you. Next Thank question. You, uh, good evening, committee. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to have a quick comment here. My name is Aaron Fakuda. I'm with Citizens for California High-Speed Rail Accountability. My opening statement might be a little different. I'd like to invite each one of you to Kings County personally. We'll take care of all the arrangements. If you think the business plan is bad, Wait till you see the design. It's horrible in Kings County. And once you see it from the ground up, you'll understand the business plan doesn't mean anything because the design is so bad. Um, Mr. Fakuda, can I ask you what you do for a living? I'm just curious. I'm a civil engineer. Great. Here's, um, we haven't quite got our issues resolved yet in terms of uh, what the timing on all this is. Uh, I'm among those who thinks that we ought not to be trying to make this decision before our June 15th budget because I think that we have a lot of questions to ask and answer, as I mentioned earlier. That being said, um, if, if in fact we um, have a schedule that permits us to go beyond that period, and I'm still hopeful that we will, um, if we are going to make the decision in August, which is, uh, I think, a more realistic time frame, I'm going to take, take you up on your offer to come visit you in Kings County. Uh, so, um, you know, I look forward to the visit, and uh, um, I think there's a lot to learn. So thank you for the offer. Well, we actually, it's oddly enough, we hope the vote comes sooner. Uh, I, I recognize the, the frustration that you guys were. No, I, I would like to have you come. All right, down. I won't come, Mr. Burton. <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to get you to come and then oh, vote. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> odd. I a turkey with <laughs> No, I, I, I recognize the frustration level that was shown today. There was quite a bit of frustration. Could you imagine the frustration that some of our landowners in Kings County have seeing this conversation go on, looking at this business plan, looking at those alignments? getting no answers from, from the authority, and yet you get insulted by saying, oh, no, it was Kings County's mismanagement of the dates for, for a, a coordination meeting. I, I just saw some quick things today. I mean, I saw the complete authority movement. Uh, they're just jumping on, grabbing things. I heard things about developing things around a station, fiber optics, things that have never been dis discussed before in a business plan. I have a recommendation for them. NASCAR is hugely popular. Let's brand this thing up to boot. You might get a little pie out of that chart covered. Um, you know, the other thing I, I saw in here was something that was really sad. Mr. Richard indicated that he saw a building go up in an alignment and he was upset because they put an alignment where a building went. Had his teams been out there doing their job, they would have recognized that those things were in the way and they needed to address them. They weren't there. So the, the last thing I wanted to comment on is the Amtrak because they've left this out. They snuck it in at the last minute. It's going to cause us a lot of pain. They said Amtrak, oh, we're going to increase the speeds. Well, they increase the speeds, but they bypass Hanford, Corcoran, Wasco. That's about 200,000 riders in ridership. Remember, that puts 200,000 people either not riding it or having to drive to Fresno. So my closing statement is, is uh, CCHSRA and its members urge the legislature to deny any funding requested by the authority. Please realize that by denying the funds to the authority, the legislature is not turning its back on high-speed rail. High-speed rail will always have a place in the California transportation alternatives. It's just this is not the right time, and really this is not the right team. Uh, everybody keeps calling uh, the uh, uh, cap-and-trade funds your backstop. So I kind of jokingly told somebody once, the authority is playing golf on a baseball field way out in left field. It's really not the right time and really not the right place. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask, who, who is your state senator and state assembly member in Kings County? I should know this and I apologize. No. Our senator is Rubio and our assembly member is David Valadeo. Thank you very much. And they would, we would be inviting them to, other than they kind of know the area. So. Okay. Thanks a million. Next witness. Thanks. Welcome. Good evening, Senators. I'm Rita Westby, co-founder of CARD, and I've come with a topic sentence, and it is oversight done right. And I would like to start by saying that I appreciate your tough questions tonight, so I'd like to put that out there. Um, although there are many potential ways to do high-speed rail right, there's really only one way to do high-speed, uh, to do oversight right, 
and that is to keep your eyes open and respond appropriately to what you see. And I've lumped together what can be seen into three categories. We've got the sniff test, this is ridership and therefore revenue and therefore operating subsidies don't quite meet the sniff test. With lowered ridership, it's not necessarily a green project anymore. Uh, there we've got the job figures, we've got the project costs that bounce around like state lottery ball. Um, then the second category would be expert opinion. So you've had expert opinion from the LAO, the peer review group, the auditor, the treasurer, and the state inspector general. Uh, the third would be, and probably the most important, is compliance with state laws. And the funding plan does not meet the law. The IOS funding is not clearly identified except through wishful thinking. And um, Disney wrote a song about wishful thinking. Uh, they're, they're maybe close to 20 billion short. Environmental clearances are not complete, and the project no longer reflects Prop 1A. Uh, these things, and in particular violations of laws you yourselves have put in place, cannot be ignored. Uh, or rather, they, they should not be ignored, but as we're learning, they can be, and they are being ignored. And, you know, that there ought to be a law, and in fact, there are laws. <laughs> which were voted on by the people of California. And these were part of Prop 1A's guarantee that nothing could go wrong. And they were part of the bold print, uh, the bold print sales pitch. They were not part of the fine print. It was what convinced voters to, to vote for this proposition. Um, so I'd say yes, there, there ought to be a law. But if you're willing to turn a blind eye and fund this project under these conditions, then why bother? Um, and so as you attempt to move this project forward towards high-speed rail done right, we ask you to hold yourselves to a higher standard, too, and we ask for oversight done right. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Welcome. Hi, thanks. My name is Nadia Nayak, and I'm also with CARD, and we didn't plan it. We were on different sides of the room, so I apologize you're getting us in sequence. Um, thank you, Senator Smitty, for your statements about how tough your decision is going to be, because I know you've been at this for a long time, and all of you have. And this is your hard work. AB 3034 reflects all the hard work that you guys put in, all the strict requirements about what they had to do, the hoops that they had to jump through. And the plan that they have before you today doesn't meet those requirements. It's unfortunate. It's been three and a half years. Everybody's been pushing them to try to get it, but they're not there. They have a funding plan that doesn't meet the environmental review. They're not done with it, and they don't have the money in place. And as much as we'd all love to hem and haw and solve the jobs issue and fix greenhouse gas emissions and cure cancer potentially with this project, we're just not there. And it's unfortunate, but the rules are what they are. And if there was an opportunity to squeak by and change a few things on AB 3034, we would have been before this committee a long time ago to try to make those fixes. But we can't. That's not what we can do. The process is what the process is. And your responsibility is to now look at the laws that you guys work so hard to make and say, you know what? Sorry, you're not meeting it. And so I'm asking you to please use your power accordingly if you don't think that this meets the law. Ms. Nyack, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot a little, and if you want to delay an answer, that's certainly understandable. Um, I know you're not a legal team. Uh, I know you're a, a community oversight organization. Uh, I think you heard earlier that we have asked the Legislative Council to uh, address the question of whether or not the plan as approved on April the 12th is Prop 1A compliant. If I could ask you to come up with the three areas where you think the plan is most far afield from Prop 1A, not compliant with Prop 1A, and share those with my staff and the committee staff, uh, and we'll pass them along to the Legislative Council's office and ask them to look specifically at those issues. Um, because I think, um, you know, this, this, as I said earlier, this is, the, the, the necessary but not necessarily sufficient question, is the project legally compliant? Because if not, as I said, the conversation gets a lot shorter. If the answer is it is, or it could be if only the following things were done, then we have a lot of work before. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, if you think that's something that you can and would like to uh, put into the process, we're going to ask you to do that when you have a chance. I'd be happy to do that, and I'll reserve the right to change my answer if I've thought about it more. But on the fly, three first things that come to mind, as Elizabeth Alexis testified, their own engineering documents. They, 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 the authority posted two hours and 40 minutes on their slides. And when you dig into the back of those documents and look at Cambridge Systematics numbers, the fastest time they have is three hours. And that's like, 
you know, there's, there isn't a single problem, and that's still really ambitious. Problem number two, they need to have a funding plan in place and environmental review completed. They don't have that, and they're saying that they can spend money on the bookends. I mean, we're still scratching our head. How do you spend Prop 1A money on the bookends when you don't have environmental review and you don't have the full money? It just doesn't meet the funding plan, but I'd be happy to turn those in, and we appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Welcome. Next witness. Mr. Chair, members, Sarah Flox of the California Labor Federation, and we have supported this project because our members want to build and operate and maintain um, high-speed rail in the state of California. And frankly, we have been very frustrated by the former leadership of the High-Speed Rail Authority and their inability to put together a plan that could put our members back to work. Um, and that's why we are have to commend um, Mr. Richard, Mr. Rossi, the staff, and the leadership of the High-Speed Rail Authority for putting together a plan that has responded to many of the concerns of the legislature that have been raised here and in local communities and is a plan that we think will allow for a substantial return on the state's investment in this project. For one, it's leveraging federal dollars and two, it's a plan that we think can also leverage private investment. Once there is public investment and basically the not the rubber, but the shovels hit the dirt, there are a number of private companies who are in, interested and it could attract that private investment in California. We know when there was a, um, a request for expressions of interest to the private sector, over 1,100 private companies responded, including companies that operate high-speed rail in other countries and that build high-speed rail in other countries who could come here. Um, and then also there's the possibility of development around the stations and have real transit-oriented development, which is not only a plan Plan for transportation in California, but for overall economic development for a growing population. Um, so with that, we support this plan. We commend the leadership um, and hope for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Welcome. Oh, I must cause a scene there. Sorry about that. Uh, Jeremy Smith here on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, uh, uh, I represent, uh, depending on the craft, um, well, the members that I represent, depending on the craft, uh, are facing upwards of 30-35% unemployment. Uh, these are things that you all know. Um, I know that unemployment is a real problem in the state, but this is the exact type of project that the state needs to help pull it out of the economic tailspin that it's in. Um, now that being said, we don't believe that means you should just willy-nilly abdicate your roles here uh, in the legislature to uh, just let it go because it's, we need the jobs. Um, I will say, though, that in my almost 10 years of, uh, of, of working in this building, I find it very hard to put my finger on an issue that has had this much debate, this much oversight, this much discussion, arguing uh, this many different plans, I'll be honest, um, I think you guys are doing a great job, and I want to thank you for all that. Um, but I don't believe you are trying uh, to make this plan perfect, but I will say I don't want perfect here to be the enemy of the good. Um, I believe that the new leadership at the board has come a long way towards good. They had a lot of work to do to make up for the past um, problems that the High Speed Rail Authority's leadership um, caused for themselves. Um, but we are very pleased not only with the new plan, um, but with the new uh, leadership over there. And we believe they are coming a long way towards answering your questions. Um, we believe they're forthright and they understand your concerns and needs. Um, and they also understand the needs of the state and the workers in the state, particularly construction workers. So uh, we support the plan. We hope that you can, at the, at the uh, earliest possible date, uh, vote out the money for the plan uh, for the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Uh, my name is Frank Oliveira. I'm with the Citizens for California High Speed Rail Accountability. To lead in with your request, I'd like to talk about duty, due diligence, and the fate of Wiley e. Coyote. Okay. I All believe he turned left at Albuquerque, if I remember my cartoons <laughs> well enough. So. Exactly. Go right ahead. Many people before me have, have said what I wanted to say, which has left me at this table with a blank thought. I was going to come here and tell you that the handout that I gave you pertaining to Prop 1A that is before you, that this business plan does not comply with Prop 1A. And if it's okay with you, I would like to send you 14 points where it doesn't comply with Prop 1A. 
if that's okay. It, it is, and we'll share those with the Legislative Council, but this is one of those places where I want to suggest to you that less may be more. Um, yes, sir. And um, my office al always asks me, why do I always have three points? And here's my answer. Because two is not enough to be compelling, and four is too many to keep track of. That's why I always have three good points. Sir, I will give you three. Uh, thank you. Happy, happy to take whatever you send, but I, I think if you pick your three best, then that gives us the opportunity to, to burrow down into them and uh, take a careful look. As far as Wiley Coyote, okay, I come from you, I come before you from the center of nowhere. We've talked about this before. I know that that is not your words. Okay. My property and the county I live in happens to be right in the middle of what used to be the ICS, which is now a chunk of the initial operating segment. There is enough money to fund what used to be the ICS, but not the operating segment. Hence, that leaves me still in the middle of nowhere because the high-speed train will never be completed with the funding streams that are out there over the Tehachapi. Why is this like Wiley Coyote? If you remember the cartoons, Wiley keeps getting ran over, gets rocks dropped on him, but he keeps springing back up because he has to go do it again and fall off a cliff. Bottom line is, we didn't know anything about this rail. We're not in a transportation corridor. It showed up and decided that we were cheap right away. We were kind of in a line between Fresno and Bakersfield. And so we'll just cut through a bunch of farmland because millions of people are going to come to the Central Valley, specifically to our location, where nobody has asked to buy my prop family's property in over 100 years. We have 150,000 people in Kings County. Population will not expand in the Central Valley the way that it's been portrayed because it is limited by water, simple water. All of that said, we, we have been abused by the high-speed rail authority over the years. It has caused people to object to this project. I ask you to do your duty and comply with Prop 1A and to protect the taxpayers of the state of California. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. One minute, please. I think I have a colleague who wants to consult. <laughs> We're straining. Brag about the Dodgers. Thank you again. Next witness. I think it's me. Um, uh, Mike Robeson on behalf of Caltrain. Um, uh, I, I wanted to just, uh, I'll, I'll try to be really quick. I want to support your leadership, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, th th this committee has done a, a fantastic job of oversight over the last few years. Um, your, your, your concept that you developed along with uh, Assemblyman Gordon and uh, Congresswoman Eshoo on the, on the blended system, um, th that, that's an idea that, 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 that you, you developed and is now reflected in the business plan and in the MOUs uh, um, that have been described by, uh, by Mr. Richards. And so I want to um, um, you know, commend you for that because that's what, what brings Caltrain in here in, in strong support. Uh, uh, the, the MOU uh, between uh, uh, the High Speed Rail Authority and the, and the MTC and the other, uh, the other entities um, in the, on the peninsula um, will, will result in the electrification of the Caltrain line, which is um, um, paramount to Caltrain's long-term viability. And, 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 and uh, um, the, without, without going forward on high speed rail, on, on funding high speed rail out of the Bond Act, with, with, the, with the Bond Act, the MOU won't come to fruition and, and then you know really Caltrain has no no other way of um, of long term viability. Uh, they, they, they they need to electrify their line and this is an opportunity to do that at the earliest possible uh, moment. So um, if to the degree um, that there's an, a, a way to appropriate um, money in this budget act to begin work on the MOUs, we would we would support that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. 
I'm Catherine Phillips with Sierra Club California. I want to thank you, uh, Senator Simidian, for this hearing and, and for the comments that Senator DeSalmier, Senator Fuller, and, and Senator Lowenthal made and the questions you asked. There, many of them are some of the questions we've been asking, too. Sierra Club California has uh, long supported cleaner transportation, a transportation system that allows people to reduce their their uh, emissions impact, greenhouse gas emissions, regular pollution, and also reduce their impact on land use, wild areas, so forth. Um, we supported Prop 1A. Um, given that, we were disappointed with aspects of the business plan in uh, November. We commented on that. We think there's been an improvement with this latest business plan, but we still have concerns about aspects of the project generally. Um, we're, we're worried a bit about what the GHG and emissions impacts will be, and I think, frankly, the LAO's testimony today makes me a little more worried. Um, the authority has assured us, um, myself and other environmentalists, that they'll be doing a, a detailed analysis that will be available within the next few weeks. We have also um, have concerns about some community impacts, whether those community impacts will be mitigated or reduced. We have concerns about um, some of the, the larger root issues. Those are things we're going to continue working through uh, in the normal course of events with the High Speed Rail Authority and with the project generally and through the, through the regular systems that allow us to make comments and so forth. What I'm here to talk about today, though, since this is a budget hearing, is I have serious concerns about the latest plan to um, draw on um, potentially draw on the auction revenue, the GHG auction revenue. Um, I think it's, it was um, pretty clearly pointed out by the LAO that that auction revenue really needs to be used in a way that assures that we get greenhouse gas reductions. But I, I want to just put a slightly different spin on it. It's not just because AB 32 says that's what we have to do. We have to do that because we really are in an environmental crisis in this world. There is climate change. We are seeing climate change impacts all over the country, all over the world. And the part that California has guaranteed that it will do is to reduce, using AB 32 and, and other methods, reduce our impact and our footprint. So I just want to underscore that I hope as this project goes forward and as you consider um, whether or not they're ready for financing, that you, you, you take into account that it's so important for those, those however that auction revenue is spent, if it is spent on this, there needs, it needs to be attached to real and soon, soonish uh, GHG reductions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses at this time? Any comments or questions at this point, Senator Fuller? Um, just want to underscore the comment I made earlier uh, about the fact that we have a, a long list of topic areas where we're going to need to drill down uh, before we get to a, a decision on this issue. Um, and again, that, that may be we have a policy committee where that may happen in an informational hearing. We have a select committee where that may happen in an informational setting. We have a budget committee that ultimately budget subcommittee in which we're now seated where we're going to have to make a budget decision at some point on all of this. So um, I will be coordinating with my colleagues to make sure that in one or more of those venues these various issues get addressed. Um, I want to just pick out somewhat randomly but somewhat purposefully a couple of areas that I want to just alert the High Speed Rail Authority uh, to uh, interest in taking up at, a, at a, our next available opportunity. The issue of outreach and engagement is more than just a process question. The eventual success or failure of this project will in large measure be a function of the authority's ability to work collaboratively and effectively with local communities up and down an 800 mile stretch. That's a lot of engagement. To date, I think it's fair to say the authority has struggled at best. Um, I want to talk with the authority about how do you propose to do that going forward and what assurances can be given, because right now it's not at all clear what the answer to those questions would be. Uh, there have been some mixed messages, as I referenced earlier, about compliance with various state environmental laws, including the California Environmental Quality Act. 
Um, some of this may be semantics. I think once we start down the semantic path, people get a little nervous. We've heard, no, we aren't really looking for any SQL exemptions. Then we've heard the word, but we might be looking for some streamlining. Um, streamlining makes some people nervous. To other people, sounds like a great idea. Let's streamline things. So I think we need to get a clearer sense and commitment from the authority about what are your expectations? What are you asking for? What assurances can you provide that there'll be full compliance? This is a matter not only of importance, as I say, on the environmental front, but again, in terms of the impact that a project of this magnitude will have up and down an 800-mile corridor if and when eventually completed. There are some management issues here that I'd also like to take up sooner rather than later. And Mr. Richard, you mentioned these in passing. At our March 13th hearing in Mountain View, if I remember correctly, and forgive me if I don't, and feel free to correct me if I'm uh, misremembering, I, I think I asked the question, is there currently a CEO in the organization? And the answer was no. Is there an assistant C CEO or a COO in place? And I think the answer was no. Is there a chief financial officer in place? And I think the answer was no. And is there a risk manager in place? And I think the answer was no. Um, those of you who sat at the table today on behalf of the authority all bring business background to you. No matter how good the plan is, I think it raises some pretty serious questions about a $68.5 billion plan being administered by an organization with what I would continue to characterize as a skeletal staff, a couple of dozen, maybe a few more, um, without leadership in key positions from what is supposed to be a part-time board, and I'm thinking some of you look like you've been working a little more than part-time lately, um, that is in theory meeting once a month through the $199 million consulting contract, which is overseen by, not entirely clear, T.Y. Lynn has the $9 million consulting contract, if I recall correctly, to oversee the $199 million contract. Real questions about who's in charge, who's the client, who's calling the shots, and perhaps most importantly, given the conversation we've had today, who's accountable? And how do we make sure that someone is accountable going forward? Because that's part of the problem I think we face to date. And then finally, I'm going to permit uh, myself a slightly parochial uh, view, which is um, at the next hearing that I participate in, I will be asking questions about the San Francisco Peninsula, the area from San Francisco to San Jose, and where we are on the conversation about a blended plan in that area and the key elements that would make that real. Last but not least, there are five different groups who have weighed in over the last three years, all of whom have real standing, significant roles to play, relatively objective, certainly nonpartisan and apolitical, the Legislative Analyst's Office, the Peer Review Group, the Institute for Transportation Studies at Berkeley, the State Auditor, and the Inspector General. They have raised a number of issues over the last three years, which the authority, and now I will use a personal pronoun, your predecessors, in many cases, never answered. We need to go back through the commentary and critique of those five bodies and say, so whatever became of those issues? Um, that is part of the due diligence that I think we have to do before we get to a decision on this issue. I want to close by saying thank you. Um, I know that there are those of you who are sitting here who have come a very long way uh, at substantial inconvenience and sometimes expense. I know you've had a long day because you started in the morning with our colleagues in the assembly. The same thanks goes to representatives of the authority, to members of the Department of Finance, to the LAO, to our staff, and to colleagues. Senator Fuller, I know you were on it all day long across the hall and then walked across the hall and have been here from start to finish. Senator de Saulnier, who does not sit as a member of this committee but thought it was important to be here for 90% of the hearing if he could. Senator Lowenthal, who is trying to be in two places at once. Thank you all. This is, I think, the kind of conversation that we have to have. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, have uh, provided this opportunity through our committee's auspices. Look forward to working with you in the weeks and months ahead. Without objection, and I anticipate none, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>